Hey, Bill. Alana? I thought we had Alana there for a second. We may have lost her. So, Albert, can you can you use your microphone? Or do you have the ability to mute on mute? Okay. Well, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. So, John, uh, we are only waiting on Alana. Oh, there she is. Alana, can you hear us? Alana, Alana Hibbler. Well, uh, John, we've got everybody but Alana. All right, well, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'll begin by reading this notice. Pursuant to the governor's executive order number 16, need to limit the community need to limit the community spread of COVID-19. The planning commission will participate by that The meeting will be live streamed to protect the public health, safety, and welfare of the members of the community. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started with um, uh, the Gallatin Municipal Regional Planning Commission work session meeting for uh, Monday, April 6th. And we'll start with item number one, which is uh, Twin Eagles Phase 15 Annexation and Plan of Service. Who's handling that item? Dustin Shane, Gallatin Planning Department. Uh, all right, for this one, this is an annexation and a plan of service for uh, Twin Eagles Phase 15. Um, that's going to be on 15.8 acres. Uh, east of Douglas Lane, west of Wildcat Run, uh, it's going to be adjacent to the Twin Eagles phases that are existing now. You can see there it's on the screen uh, outlined in yellow. It's going to have a connection to Douglas Lane and to the streets that are internal to Twin Eagles. Um, as far as the annexation, we'll discuss some more of the technical aspects when we talk about the PMDP in the next item. For the for the annexation, uh, the reports we're working on, we're finding that it, it will be revenue positive for the city uh, as far as providing services to this this project uh, with this with the scale of it. Um, like I said, it's going to have that access to Douglas Lane which is uh, crucial at this point for Twin Eagles to have another ingress-egress point. Um, it's going to have to have uh, GPU working with White House Utilities to uh, take over the water service. Uh, the rest of the utilities, or all of the utilities pretty much, can be extended uh, from internal to the Twin Eagles. Um, and then, like I said, we'll, we'll discuss some other things when we talk about the PMDP. But as an annexation, uh, 
we're we're finding that it's a um, that it works out. Hello. The numbers do. All right. Thank you, Dustin. Do we have a, a representative for the applicant present? John, this is Andy with Greenlit. I'm here. Thank you, Andy. Uh, do you have any comments? Uh, no, sir, not at this time. The questions from any members of the commission? Well, I'll start with a question. So it appears that the annexation will go all the way over to Douglas Lane. Is that correct? That's currently what we're proposing, Chairman, yes, um, just to put the right-of-way that's required into the city of Gallatin. Okay, but Douglas Lane itself is not um, in the city of Gallatin? Correct, correct. Douglas is a county road. Any other? Sure, if I'm watching uh, or raise hands on the screen, or if, if I'm supposed to look for a, a hands up indicator on the session, I think I can see everyone. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I don't have, any. I don't have anything. It looks good to me. Okay. I have none. And if there's no other comment, Study it more. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Uh, well, item number two is uh, Twin Eagles uh, rezoning. Same item, I assume. Uh, All right, are we ready? Yes. Uh, Dustin Shane Gallatin Planning. Uh, for the so for on the PMDP. You'll go to the next slide. Uh, they're wanting to rezone to MU, which is what the rest of Twin Eagles is zoned. Um, we're suggesting possibly an R8 PRD. Um, that is the applicant's choice, but there isn't really anything mixed use about this, which is which is why. Uh, but you know, we acknowledge that the rest of Twin Eagles is zoned uh, MU. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so that the the right of way that's coming through there, we're gonna we're requiring that that be built to city standards. Uh, next slide. Next slide. And they've on the west side there, um, the the buffer yard they're proposing is not uh, large enough base, uh, per code, so we're asking them to increase that. Um, there's also a question I think Stormwater had about enough uh, water quality management areas. Uh, so that would might be something they want to speak to. Um, and then we're also going to have some, require some traffic calming measures to be implemented on the roads. Alright. Andy, do you have any comment? Sorry, Andy Lee, the, uh, This is Andy with Green Lid. Um, I, you know, the only comment that I've got that in talking to the owner of the project, um, you know, we we're currently getting a hydraulic determination done to address the stormwater areas, which we would definitely do with the FMDP submittal. Um, the buffer yard, we feel like we we've always worked that out with with uh, planning commission and staff, so uh, we're agreeable to working something out there with you on that. The issue of building the road out to Douglas is something that's a little more concerning to the developer with, um, you know, not be, not really proposing to build the utilities out that way currently. Um, we were just wanting to build a road out there that would give fire and safety access, not just fire and safety, but people, you know, the emergency access they need to another street. Um, if we have to build that to city standards, it's going to change the, 
the ball game here and what we what we need to do. Um, can I ask a question, John. Yeah, uh, uh, Councilman Sean Pennell. Can you hear me, Andy? Yes, sir. Are you talking about going ahead and paving this road on this right away right now? Yes, that's what we're talking about to Douglas. We're not opposed to building a, uh, a road that would meet the safety requirements for the fire department and the police department and everyone else. We had that discussion in the pre-app meeting. Uh, but to, to completely finish it out with sidewalks and asphalt at this time, we feel like it's premature until we extend utilities and start building houses back there. Oh, well, that was my question is, is why would we pave a road right now if we got to go back in? Wouldn't we be tearing the road back up as more lots was to be developed in the future? Yes, most likely if we build it right now, it's going to get, um, you know, not be where we need it to be at in the future. And, of course, you know, the, the developer here has a different business model than, you know, we're not a track, we're not a nationwide builder, so we got to bite off smaller chunks. And, and right now we're biting off about a 40, 50 lot, well, 30, I don't remember, Dustin can tell you how many lots it is, but somewhere between 30, 40 lots. And, you know, it's just not, it's not our model to bite off 100 lots at a time. That's what I was wondering, because if this economy was to take a downturn, and it's going to be a, I know we're not supposed to mention expense or anything, but uh, is, is going, going ahead and doing the, the, the road and pavement, it kind of commits you for all the lots right now. That's our concern, and we're not opposed to bonding the road um, for the asphalt should something drastically happen here in the near future. Uh, that way the city's protected on their end. I'm, I'm personally with you on that, Andy. Andy, this is Bill McCoy. Yes, sir. Is there a possibility of obstructing the first phase of, of, or sub-phase of this Section 15 on the westerly portion so that uh, there is no more loading of trips onto the local street network within the existing subdivision? So what you're talking about is build the subdivision out from Douglas back east. Is that what you're asking, if that's feasible? Yes. I, I realize I utilities still. Yeah, the, the utilities are the biggest. Uh, all the utilities are coming from the east. Okay. Uh, who, who's representing from engineering? Yeah. Nick? Yeah, can you hear me? I can now. Did, Nick, did you want to address the issue about the connection to Douglas Lane? Sure. sure. Uh, I understand uh, the argument if you're looking at uh, this piece of development as a standalone development that uh, building um, however long that, that stretch of roadway is to, to city standards at this point. <clears throat> but it's not really a standalone development. This we're 475 houses in uh, to this uh, Twin Eagles development, and we only have one way in and out. Um, and I understand uh, the thought of um, just bringing this to a standard to support a fire truck. <clears throat> um, in, in other words, just making it a gravel drive, and and that's an okay um, way to approach this, uh, but um, we all know that gravel drives, uh, when, when left sitting for a couple of years, um, they require much more maintenance than asphalt does, and potholes, uh, things of that nature could form, um, and, and now you're, you're losing the ability to, to get back and forth on that gravel drive, even for emergency access. Uh, but the other part of this is that um, you really need to think about this as a necessary um, access for the, the everyday citizen, uh, not just for emergency, because again, uh, this development's been approved for over 475 lots uh, with only one way in and one way out. Um, and I don't 
uh, you can look at um, standards all across the country and, and find that to, uh, to, to far exceed um, any kind of um, good practice for um, access to development. And we only have to look back to the tornado that ripped through Middle Tennessee just um, a month ago and, and understand why it's important to have more than one way in and more one way out for uh, a development. Uh, so uh, with, it, it's yeah, just, just as um, Dustin had mentioned earlier, it's definitely our position that um, we need to have um, a roadway that's extended out um, to Douglas Lane as another way in and out. Uh, I have a question for, really, I guess for engineering, maybe for the applicant, but if it were to be built as a gravel road right now for emergency access, the public can be using it as for non-emergency access. The public could use a gravel drive. Um, that's not a standard that the city uh, currently allows um, in our subdivision regulations. Um, any kind of um, roadway uh, that would be constructed uh, to a subreg standard would be required to be uh, paved. And we've got paving standards for the type of, of roadway as well, the, the thicknesses and all that are required. And so, you know, it, it is possible uh, to build a gravel drive um, and, and open it up to public use, uh, but you know that that's kind of setting <laughs> setting back um uh, i guess city life no, 50 I'm years you, I'm, I'm afraid you misunderstood my question i'm i'm concerned that gravel will be put down and then the public will start using it i don't think the public should use it if they're going to do a gravel drive but on a temporary basis for a couple of years how would we prevent the public from using that access in that interim. Right. I think the only way that you can do that is to try to gate it. Uh, you would want uh, to have uh, the Knox Hawk uh, locks on the there. We've got some it. other private gates that are gated like that. I'll drive. I think that's what the conversation is. Drive is for emergency access only. Does anyone else on the commission have any questions or comments or concerns? Well, it's, I, 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 my, my concern would be, I think, somewhat as yours, John, is a, a gravel road that's accessible for public use probably is not a good idea. So if, if it's going to be something the public to be able to use, it, it needs to be paved, in my opinion. Uh, we have a similar situation now in the city on the northwest part of the Cambridge Farm subdivision. The reserve has a temporary road there uh, that connects to Highway 25 at the northwest part, uh, extreme northwest part of Cambridge Farms. And, uh, you know, it does provide a, an access in and out of there. I guess it is used some not very much but um, it is not a city maintained road and uh, I, I don't know what kind of condition it is Nick I guess would have better information on that but that is something that's been done in the past and for purposes of public access I don't, it doesn't seem like it's a very good idea There are no other comments, then we'll move along to item three. Does anyone else have any comments about item two? Uh, so item three is uh, twin equals phase four, section four, uh, final flat. Dustin Shane Gallatin Planning. Uh, so, y'all approved the uh, preliminary plat for this last month. Uh, this is just the final plat. Um, it didn't come before you because the construction documents, I think, weren't done. Uh, but now this is just the final plat. Like you said, last time we've, we've talked about this item quite a bit. 
Um, they met all of our conditions. Uh, so this is just the final plat before y'all. Hey, John. This is Josh. Can you yeah. try and focus your voice more towards the microphone? You're starting to cut in and out a little bit. Sure. Um, let me move my phone a little closer. Okay. Do we have a, a representative for the applicant? Yeah, this is Andy again, John, with Greenlid. We've got nothing to add. Questions or comments from anyone on the commission? I think Nick Tuttle is wishing to speak. Tuttle, city engineer. Yeah, thank you, John. I had one quick comment. We are still working through um, the stormwater calculations on this. And um, if we don't have that resolved um, here in, in a, a few days, week or so, uh, you won't see this on the agenda as it won't have approved um, construction drawings. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay. Any none, let's move on to item number four. Can y'all hear me better? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, item number four is Reverie Point at Foxland Harbor, amended preliminary master development plan. Who's Who's handling this one? Dustin Shane, Galton Planning. Uh, so this is, as you remember, um, we just approved the, y'all just approved the, the fourth section of phase two uh, about a month or two ago, which was a continuation of the high rise towers uh, at Foxland there on the, on the lake. Um, so this is the next phase. And in the preliminary development plan, master development plan they had they were extending the the high-rise towers south well they've scaled that back so this is actually a reduction in the density and the intensity of the PMDP so we're recommending this to be a, a minor amendment to the PMDP um, and then it's an FMDP also for this uh, but it's going to be 12 townhomes uh, that are that are much that are actually a good transition between the, the towers and the single family homes uh, further to the south. So uh, we're, they're, they're asking for some side yard setbacks and PUDE exceptions, which are not anything out of the ordinary. Um, I think stormwater might have some, just some concerns about their, their uh, proposed system. Um, the other thing, the things planning will need will be the uh, a photometric plan, and then also just their their percentages for their architecture here for the brick and stone. Uh, the the style matches with what's what's already there in the in the development. We also are wondering too about the roads if they're if they're proposed to be public or private. Okay, and do we have a representative for the applicant? I think Joe Godfrey is on the line. We do, Mr. Chairman. It's just taking me a minute to find him in the list. There we go. Chair Godfrey? Yes. You are on. Do you have anything to add to the presentation? I will answer the question regarding the street. It will be a private street, which it has been the whole time in, in the uh, PMDP. And um, there is a gated entrance right there at the corner of Club View and Raynard to get into the whole uh, phase two section there. And the on the stormwater, uh, we are working on a, another alternative, uh, which we'll have complete by Thursday to turn in. Do we have any, um, before we get to the commission members, do we have any other department engineering or anyone else who uh, needs to speak on this? Does anyone on the commission have any questions? I don't have, I don't have any questions. I will say I, I agree. This is a, I think it's an improvement for the transition from the rest of Foxland uh, going to the towers. So I, I see this as a positive. 
Yeah, I see it as a positive and certainly see it as a minor amendment. Yeah. Uh, any other, anyone else have any comment? I can't Oh, it's nice over there. I looked at it yesterday from the lake. It's beautiful. That it is. Um, well, seeing none, I, I don't see any issues. Um, I think we'll see you back in a couple of weeks then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, item number six, or item number five, is Montgomery Office of Rezoning with Preliminary Master Development Plan. Who's handling this item? Um, is that Jilly? I can't hear you. Which staff member is handling item number five? This is Jillian. I believe we're having some issues with her microphone. Okay, we'll, we'll wait a minute. Jillian, are you good? Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, this is Montgomery office. It's a rezoning with PMVP located on Nashville Pike. It is, uh, this is Tula Poplar and Lakeshore Drive. It Josh? Is, yes, Bill. Jillian's going to come into my office and present. Okay. I believe Gene Carmen is the uh, building next door that's shown here on the screen. This is a single family residential dwelling located here on the screen. It's currently zoned R40, whereas the surrounding zonings are MRO, which is mixed residential office. It is part of the Nashville Pike overlay. And I'm running out of things to stall this with until Jillian gets here. Josh, is that, can I ask you a question, Josh? Yes, please. Is that part of the same overlay on that particular piece of property across the street? It runs from low division all the way up to uh, Verizon? It is. It is part of the Nashville Pike overlay that goes from uh, roughly here all the way back over okay. to the edge, uh, over towards Walmart. Okay, and this property we're talking about is on the opposite side of the road, correct? It is located on the south side of uh, oh, Nashville Pike. Okay, gotcha. Jillian, do we have you back yet? No, Jillian's not here yet. She's printing out her presentation. So okay. Can sit at my desk and give the presentation. Hey, I would just add that. If, uh, if Jillian needs some time, maybe. That, um, there's a lot of you were saying. Um, sorry, John. Can I add in um, along with Sean Fennell was was um, commenting on uh, the the applicant um, has done a good job and in, in conforming to uh, that the the plan for access and they're connecting um, existing frontage drives and, and it looks really good. Nick, I'm not sure about the rest of the members, but I, I really couldn't understand um, what you were saying. We have a bad connection. Can I just go with the microphone? Does that sound better? No. Yeah. Can I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down uh, all the commission members as to whether you can hear uh, Nick clearly enough to understand what he's telling us. Commissioners, um, I, I think I heard what Nick was saying with the access management was proposed with the shared driveway is uh, a good practice and they support that. And we'll also have a staff in the property to the east, which will allow for future access of that service drive parallel to Highway 31. 
that would be compliant with the access management plan part of the natural bike overlay. So can I ask you a question? Certainly. Is this overlay, does it also, uh, does it also have a tree ordinance that's uh, with this overlay also? Uh, it's not a tree ordinance, but the policy in that plan talks about saving the buildings as well as the landscape and the tree. It's not really specific. It's more of a general policy type uh, document. Gillian, are you um, ready to present this item? No, we can't hear you, Julian. Hear me? I can barely hear you, Julian. Okay, I'm going to Bill's office. No, oh, now I can hear you. Yeah, you're now. Well, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> that that may work best. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, where's your camera? Uh, right here. Hi, can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um so the applicant request to rezone a half acre lot from R40 low density residential to MRO, multiple residential and office district with a preliminary master development plan to convert an existing residential building into an office space. This is located at 1191 Nashville Pike. Um, I heard there was already some discussion about access and things like that. So the proposed zoning is consistent with the adjacent properties um, and the Nashville Pike corridor plan. Uh, the BMDP includes the proposed parking and landscaping and will also remove the existing driveway. Access will be provided by the adjoining properties. The plan needs better connectivity of sidewalks within the site, including a sidewalk connection from the proposed public sidewalk. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you have. So Jillian, that's, that's going to connect the frontage road into where the Gene Carmen real estate office is next door. Is that what I understand? Yes. Okay. Uh, do we have a representative for the applicant present? This is Andy with Greenlid. Do you have any comments, Andy? Uh, no, I know landscaping was mentioned by Councilman Fennell, and I will say that I went out there today to do a tree survey, and there are many large trees on the site, and I say many. I mean, having five or six on a site this large or this small is, is a lot, in my opinion. Um, I revised the landscape plan to preserve those trees. Uh, most of them are in the rear. There are a few in the front. It looks like the plan that I have submitted to you all will only require the removal of one mature tree and uh, maybe a few smaller, smaller trees that uh, – are, are like four inches in diameter. Well, Andy, I know you to be a straight up guy and, 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 and would tell us the facts, but this plan, is it possible we don't have the right plan? All these buffer yard trees are like exactly in the 15 uh, foot buffer. It, it doesn't look like we had to work around anything. Did, I mean, did you get that well, lucky? No, 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 you're, <laughs> so. The plan in front of you didn't have the existing trees on there. That was a comment from, from staff to put those on the plan, and I, I went out there and did that today. I understand. Uh, okay. So it will, when, when, you, when you see the final plan come back to you, there will be some adjustments in the buffer yard. to you, Like on the, uh, on the east side of the site, there's a 36-inch poplar tree over there. Wow. So instead of getting anywhere near that thing and its root system to plant another tree, which probably wouldn't survive in its mm -hmm. canopy anyway, I've, I've adjusted the buffer around that tree. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Andy or for staff? 
Andy, I believe this property is the lady. She's an employee for uh, the city of Galton. And, and am I correct in saying that is the property I'm thinking of? Oh, the, the previous owner was a, a, um, a lady named Ms. Clymer. And uh, okay. uh, the Montgomery's bought it last week. The Montgomery's. Uh, okay, I'm familiar with the property. This is one of the last residentially zoned properties in this corridor. Mm -hmm. They're going to take the existing house and make some offices inside of it. Yes. yes. As far as I know, they're not proposing any changes to the exterior, just remodeling the inside for their engineering office. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions or comment? Um, all right. Well, seeing none, then we'll we'll see you back in a couple of weeks, and uh, and I mean you'll bring us the revised landscape plan back with that prior to that meeting. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Item number six. We'll move on. Is uh, Kensington Downs Phase One B Final Plat? Which <laughs> staff this item? Yes, this is mine, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Um, the applicant requests approval of a final plat for Kensington Downs Phase 1B on 10.26 acres for 29 total residential units. The Phase 1A final plat was approved last month. The plat is consistent with the FMBP, uh, and I'm happy to take any other questions. Uh, Josh, if you could change the slide. Again. Do we have a... There we go. Do you have any further comments, Jillian? I don't. Okay, do we have a representative for the applicant? President? Uh, this is Jim Harris. I'm a CSTG. Just here to answer any questions. Do we have any questions uh, for Mr. Harris, the members of the commission, or questions for staff? I think it looks good. No, I think everything looks good, and we'll see you back in a couple weeks. Thank you. It's usually two. Item number seven is JL Hale property uh, final plat, and which staff member is handling this item? Uh, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Uh, change the side slide, please. Uh, the applicant requests approval of a final plat for JL Hale property on 2.5 acres, zoned R15, located at 815 Hartsville Pike and 248 and 252 Mark Circle. The plat will replat three parcels into five single family lots and will be consistent with the existing zoning. Staff recommended that the applicant reach out to the adjacent property owner to the west on Mark Circle as lot four of the original East Mead plat was, re was subdivided, most likely illegally at some point, and this would be a chance to rectify this. Now that is a different property owner as opposed to the person who is plotting all of that, but that was a comment that staff had. Um, I believe Bruce Rainey is the surveyor on this, and so I believe he's on this call. Um, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions you might have. Hey, Jillian, it's Matt. The, uh, but the lots they're proposing are consistent with the current zoning, so they're not asking for any zoning changes. It's just this is going to be very similar to what's already around it. Correct. Okay. Before we get into any other questions, I think. I think we have a representative for the applicant um, on the line. Is that correct? I think Bruce. Yes. You know, I saw Bruce. Yes, Bruce Rainey here. I really don't have anything to add to what staff is proposed. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, any other questions on this? Not 
seeing anybody raise their hand, so um, seeing none, we'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number eight is Kennesaw Farms Office Park Preliminary Plat. And which staff member is handling this item? Yes, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Uh, the applicant requests approval of a preliminary plat for the Kennesaw Office Park located on Kennesaw Boulevard. The FMDP for three buildings of the Office Park was recently approved by Planning Commission. Staff requested that the pre-plat, which currently shows all buildings and lots within the Kennesaw Office Park, only include the three buildings and lots that have an FMDP already. Um, the other lots will require an FMDP prior to a preliminary plat although this plat can show any easements or utilities that they need in the remainder. This will make the pre-plat match the final plat, which is item number nine on this agenda. And I believe there's also an applicant on the line for this one. Um, Josh, pull the plat up. Uh, this is Cal Gentry with Southeastern Building. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, we agree with everything Jillian said and just here to answer any questions. Do we have any questions for um, the applicant or for member of staff? At all? Okay. We'll, uh, we'll see you back in a couple of weeks then. Thank you. Uh, well, sorry, hang around. It's uh, <laughs> item number is Kennesaw Farms Office Park, Section 1, Final Plat. Jillian, are you handling this? Yes, um, Josh, if you could pull the plat up. Um, this will be just the final plat for uh, Kennesaw Office Park, Section 1. Um, so once they revise the preliminary plat, this is pretty much what the preliminary plat will look like as well, with just a little bit more information on it. Um, this includes 4.24 acres. And there was an FMDP recently approved for these three lots that they'll be making. Um, and it is consistent with that FMDP. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Cal, are you still on the line? Do you have any comments or anything to add for us? Cal Gentry, representative for the applicant. Yes, Mr. Purry, you're still here. I don't have anything to add and can just answer any questions you guys have. Questions from anybody on the commission? I think this is what we've uh, we've studied this item before. Yeah, it, it looks good. No other comments. Well, then we'll see you back in a couple of weeks, Cal. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number ten, which is Dollar General site plan. And which staff member is handling this item? Uh, Jillian Ogden, staff planner. Uh, the applicant requests approval of a site plan for Dollar General on 1.13 acre lot. Uh, Josh, if you could pull a couple slides to the main site plan. So this is located off of Albert Gallatin. Um, it is zoned uh, CS commercial services, so it only requires a site plan. Uh, the plan includes uh, the parking and landscaping as required. Uh, note there is a request uh, for the rear buffer yard. They are showing a 20-foot 20, 20 buffer yard versus a 35-foot buffer yard. Um, that is adjacent to R49, um, which is uh, the school property is back there behind those lots. Um, so that is an alternative the Planning Commission will have to consider. Uh, the 9100 square foot store will be constructed entirely of brick and stone as required by code. Um, Josh, if you could go with a couple slides to the architecture. Um, the applicant has had some discussions with the engineering department about a connection to the existing business to the east um, as an access road. Um, they can provide more information on that issue. Uh, Josh, if you want to go back to the main plan. Yeah, um, and I believe there is an applicant on online for, for to speak to this item, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Yes, this is applicant. 
Yes, this is Cole Wigger with Reagan Smith Associates. Uh, to speak to Jillian's point, the engineering staff has asked that we make a connection to the eastern property. Uh, we're currently working closely with engineering and planning staff to make that happen. And uh, happy to answer any other questions you may have. Do we have any questions from a member of the commission? Can I say something, John? Mr. Chairman, uh, location of it, of course, I'm near Albert Gallatin. I, what business are we talking about that it's next to? There you go. There. Next to the county building right there. That's the USDA building mm -hmm. directly adjacent to our property. Gotcha. Okay. I know where it's at. Thank you. No problem. So, what's okay. discussion um, at the other Dollar General site on, um, well, out on Vietnam? Vietnam. Thanks. Um, we had a lot of discussion about architecture. If I understood staff correctly, all we're looking at here is a site plan. Is that correct? Well, this includes the architecture, but it doesn't require a master development plan like that. Um, Dollar General did because of its zoning. It was zoned PGC. So this was just site plan review. And from a staff perspective, this meets code for the architecture. Okay. But I'll, and I'll add, I think I think they did a good job on the architecture for Yeah, I think I do so. Mm -hmm. okay. Hey Julie, my question, the the alternate for the buffer yard, what is on the uh, I think it's the USDA office building that's to the right? Mm -hmm. is what type of buffer yard do they have behind those buildings um i'm not sure you can kind of see the edge of the, the park. Yeah, it doesn't look like much is why i'm asking it doesn't look like 35 feet um oh. so i'm not sure how i don't mm, actually i have the plan let me look So they were approved at the time that this plan was done. It was an alternative type 50 buffer yard that was required there, and they only made them do a 30 foot. Okay. So that's what's back behind the USDA is 30 feet. Okay. Yeah. It's, the aerial view doesn't look like 30 feet of buffer, but it's hard to tell. So. Okay. Yeah, that's from the back property line to the parking spaces 30 feet and the the property so behind this dollar general site and toward the school is that that'll that's that property all belongs to the school so there's, there's not a chance it's going to turn into residential housing or some other type of use back there is it yeah that's the school property okay yeah then I, to, I, to speak to the to speak to the buffer uh we're we're uh using the buffer that was on the plat and it is it's similar to the buffer directly adjacent to the USDA building, just to the east of the USDA building. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have a problem with it. I'm just asking a question, but I, I, I think it looks good this way. Perfect, thank you. So I do have a question. Uh, Dr. Gain, are you wanting to speak? Okay. Um, so I had a question. Did I understand engineering or staff to say that they want a connection to the east to connect to that um, um, existing commercial property to the east? Yes, and the applicant has been talking to the engineering department about that. So I would stress that it's really, that's a really important issue for us because as Hatton Track gets completed, it's going to increase a lot of traffic on Albert Gallon. Sure. And we need those frontage roads. So I would just underscore that as being a very important point. I agree. John, this is Nick. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, and we, we agree with you. Um, and matter of fact, when we were researching the, the property adjacent, uh, we found uh, that uh, the USDA site, when it was developed, they actually recorded an easement uh, that was separate from the plat that was uh, dedicated uh, so that cross access could be had there at the front of the um, the businesses and and uh, Reagan Smith actually sent, sent something over to us today that that actually 
goes through that easement. I think we may have um, may have to work with them a little bit on their stormwater. Uh, maybe be a little more flexible than we might normally, uh, but we believe that it's worth it for this site. So, so I, where their site, they're not being Dollar General, but the one next door does not extend over to the property line. They don't have a a curb cut over to the property line. Who would incur the cost of making that connection on somebody else's property? Well, you're right. They they didn't actually build the stub. Uh, but we would expect that Dollar General would make the connection since the easement was dedicated. Um, and they're the, the second ones in here. So we believe that they have the right to make the connection. And um, it, it's just, it is on someone else's property, but it's dedicated for the use um, uh, for the property here that the Dollar General is developing. Okay. And the only other question I had is in Dollar General site plan, um, the connection uh, to the west is much closer to the street. So is that what we're trying to do is shift that um, that frontage road a little bit closer to the street for the remainder of the undeveloped properties along that strip of Albert Gallatin? Well, that's actually exactly where the easement lines up. So what you're seeing in front of you right now, um, it, I don't know that I can, I can show you, uh, but there, there's a 50 foot building setback line uh, that maybe Jillian or whoever, Josh, yeah, there's a 50 foot building setback line right there. And then 25 foot towards the right of way, there's a 25 foot um, easement line that's shown. Between those two lines, it's where the, uh, the access easement to the east uh, would line up uh, with the USDA. And so it actually is their, their front drive that's on the USDA site. And so it would it would actually go uh, right in line with this stub out that they are showing uh, to the west to the undeveloped property. Uh, it's not uh, the um, uh, I wouldn't say it's it's the greatest uh, for for sharing access, but it's much better than than not having um, access shared at all. I'd compare it a lot to um, what you see in Bowling Green. Uh, there um, around the Greenwood Mall uh, where they have that front end road that, that runs along uh, the Highway 231 there, if you're familiar with that, which again, it's not the greatest, but um, it does it does serve a purpose. Um, and I think it is useful and helpful. No, that's no, the greatest. And that clears it up for me. I thought y'all were asking them to extend uh, Dollar General to uh, make a curb cut at the right side of their existing parking lot or mm -hmm. their proposed parking lot. You're talking about coming all the way across the front of the property. Yeah, they're actually going to, right now, you don't see it on your plan, but uh, what, what's in the front of their property is their stormwater area. They've got, there you go, that shows um, a water quality pond and a, a detention pond. All of those things will essentially go underground. Uh, while a drive is, is going to be built across them. Uh, they mentioned um, hopefully still using some bioretention uh, that will be surface bioretention, uh, but um, looking at pavers and uh, probably some underground detention um, and maybe even some underground uh, treatment as well. Very good. Any, any other questions from a uh, member of the commission? Mr. Wilson, are you, are you trying to, are you asking a question? All right, seeing none, I'll, uh, we'll move on and uh, we'll, we'll see Dollar General back in a couple of weeks. We'll move on. Thank you. Uh, which staff member is handling this item? That would be me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've discussed this a few times over the past several months. The applicant is asking for a buffer yard alternative. The homeowners within the Cairo Estates subdivision uh, have objected to buff uh, plantings being located behind 
on the rear of their lots, specifically here, here, uh, this one, here, and here. Uh, the homeowners have, uh, previous homeowners and current homeowners have uh, actually removed plantings from that area and relocated them throughout the subdivision. So we've worked with the applicant and the uh, overall property owner and HOA to locate all of the trees that have been installed and relocated elsewhere on the property and also uh, a deficit of trees that are going to be placed with the Planning Commission's approval of the alternative buffer yard uh, in some bioretention reforestation areas here as indicated on the screen and also uh, in the stream buffer in this area here. Uh, so with this alternative buffer yard, we're also going to run into this problem uh, time and time again with trees in small lots and buffer yards and homeowners. So one of the solutions that staff has been discussing is requiring buffer yards to be located only in open spaces and not on single family residential lots. Do we have a representative for the applicant here? Yes, this is Andy with Greenlid. This is Andy with Greenlid. Yes, Andy, go ahead. Uh, we don't have anything to add there, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then um, I'll open it up for comments. Well, this is the same situation we're facing over right now at um, the lots on Langley Hall, I believe. Don't we have a buffer uh, buffer requirements that, that are part of the lot so that we could avoid the creation of a homeless association for a small subdivision? That sounds kind of similar to what we're facing right here. It's, they're very similar issues, Mr. Chairman. I'm not familiar with the one at Langley. Who was speaking? I'm sorry. Oh, this is Andy, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with what might be going on at Langley right now. Um, that we had the discussion about the developer or the person selling the lots did not want to create a, a homeowners association for just a small 18 lot subdivision. So they put the buffer requirement as part of the lots, which is exactly what's been done with this one. And we're seeing the effects of that is that we can't control those buffers on the lot and want to do with their lot as they please. Are these recorded on this project? Is it recorded as a landscape easement, a public utility and drainage easement, something? Josh, question. That's a possibility. All the, again, enforcement becomes incredibly difficult when it comes to uh, single family residential ownership and having city employees tromp across through your backyard uh, over time. Uh, questions or comments from other members of the commission? I, my, my only comment is, you know, it's, it's, when we had the same conversation on Langley Estates, is this is a really good example of why we, we don't need to to do buffer yards this way. I agree. And other than that, I don't have any comments on it. Andy, did you, were you want to speak? Yeah, if I can interject here, just, uh, you know, this is not a scenario where the, the owner is trying to get out of it. He's actually planted these buffers. And in the submittal, you'll see where we went out and did a tree survey of what's in and what's out. You'll see where there's a section in and then a section out and another section in. You know, we're not trying to save money. We're not trying to get out doing anything. Um, the owners are literally digging the material out of the ground. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I can attest to that. We've been working uh, over the past five or six months very closely with both uh, Andy's team and the overall uh, ownership of the 
subdivision on locating trees, uh, locating the trees that have been removed uh, and working very closely with both of those teams on creating this plan that's presented before you today. Yeah, Andy, I wasn't suggesting that, that the developers the problem here. I'm just saying it's unenforceable when we have these buffers on private property. I know I, I get that, but it's it's no it's no secret that sometimes buffer yards are seen more as an expenditure than an asset. So, um, and this, but this I just wanted to interject here that this is not the case. We would happily put the buffer in and, and close out this project if we could. Um, but the problem is we can't. The maintenance period can't expire before the material disappears. Um. Any questions from other members of the commission? No? Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll stay back in a couple of weeks then. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, item number 12 is uh, Metal Glen at Fairway Farms, Section 3. Which staff member is handling this item? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Josh again uh, for Sharon Burton, who's the project planner on both section three and section four of Meadow Glen. This is a final plat for uh, this phase of Meadow Glen. The, it matches the FMD, the approved FMDP for sections three and sections four. Uh, staff has nothing to add on either of these items. Do we have a representative? Uh, for the applicant present? They are... Jim, you should be unmuted. Oh, wrong one. This is Jim Harrison with CSDG, just here to answer any questions. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from members of the commission? either for the representative of the applicant or Mr. Chairman, it's Bill McCord. I have, I have a question, if you don't mind. Yes. Yeah, an echo for some reason. Uh, Jim, is uh, the low bar going to be filed here real soon? before the plat is ready for recording? Again, if I can have everyone mute your microphone if you're not speaking, please. I'll I ask the question again, Jim, will you have a LOMAR completed and a map amendment completed before the final plat is to be recorded? I, I guess he can't hear me. Jim, are you there? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about that. Got oh. bumped out. Okay, Jim, I'll ask again. Uh, is the map amendment going to be completed before the final plat's ready for recording? Floodplain map? Uh, they're in there, yes, it will. They're doing the fill right now, so we'll be processing that through. So, yes, sir, it will be. Okay, so we'll be able to hold off on recording this plat until the LOMAR is actually complete and we can receive feedback from or notification from FEMA. That's correct. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Any uh, questions from members of the commission for uh, to
to the applicant or to staff or comment. Not seeing any hands, so uh, seeing none, then we'll uh, we'll move on to the next item, which is also Meadow Glen at Fairway Farms, Section Four, uh, Final Plat. Is that Josh? Are you handling that? That would be me again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again. The section four matches the approved FMDP. This is a final plat to record the individual lots. Uh, we, have, we have no issues to note. And do we have a representative for the applicant? Would that be Jim? Yeah, that's the Jim or CSDG again. Uh, just here to answer any questions, I will say before the question gets asked, the same thing that we just talked about on Section 3 applies on Section 4 about the FEMA flood map amendment. We'll have that in place before we record it. Do we have any questions for the applicant or for member staff? <coughs> no one? Very well. We'll see you back in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number 14, which is Ice Crown. Final Master Development. Staff member is handling this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This item has been withdrawn by the applicant. Okay. Item has been withdrawn. Um, Item number 15 is uh, zoning ordinance amendment home to the ages. Who's handling that? Is that Bill? That would be me. That would be me again, Mr. Chairman. But I'm going to ask everyone to please mute your microphone if you are not currently speaking. We're getting a little bit of background interference. So we've been talking about uh, Home for the Aged as a zoning ordinance amendment for several months. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to introduce is some terminology. So Homes for the Aged is a state-defined term. Uh, person with a disability is a state-defined term. Some of the socially accepted vernacular terms that we can use during our discussion are uh, senior adults, residents of Homes for the Aged as defined by TCA, and persons with intellectual disabilities. The uh, included in your packets was a draft ordinance that used the strict definition mirroring what TCA uh, says. The it would be a conditional use in all residential district and a conditional use in all mixed use districts, not permitted in commercial only districts. The draft that you have before you requires a little bit of tweaking on minimum separation and also minimum maximum parking standards. Uh, other options that are on the table is we could def further define homes for the aged to include adult care homes, which is a level two care home facility as defined by the state, the independent living facility, a residential HIV supportive living facility, residential hospice or a traumatic brain injury residential home. All of them are further defined within TCA code, which there should be a link to. A community residential home as defined by our zoning ordinance, the current definition restricts it to TCA 1324-101 uh, and 1324-104. The Gallatin zoning ordinance requires residents to be mentally handicapped. Uh, TCA code 101 requires a person with a disability and does not include persons with a mental illness. Uh, 104, this part does not apply to such facility residences wherein persons with disabilities reside. So the homes for the aged could be defined to fit within our current community residential home uh, within the Gallatin zoning ordinance, which would be an allowed right in all residential districts. So we would treat it essentially the same as uh, what we define as a group home. So those are three options that are on the table. So either uh, further defining it to add these five other defined terms within TCA, 
fitting it in the, under the definition and revising our zoning ordinance to mirror uh, to expand the definition of community residential home uh, or as currently planned where it would be conditionally used in residential and mixed use district a little bit of tweaking on minimum separation and minimum maximum parking standards And then this is a copy of the draft ordinance that was included in your overall packet, including exhibit A, which would be the specific areas of the zoning ordinance that would have to be defined under option three. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And commissioners, there's the, this option that's also being considered, it, of course, is expanding eligible uses within the community residential home uh, to reference uh, adult care home, which is a licensed facility with up to five adults. Um, and then also for the home for the aged, which is a licensed facility with uh, four or more non-related persons. Now, it doesn't say how many more. So we might want to look at options that allow it as a use by right, like a community residential home is through the statute. And then under certain circumstances, such as larger community uh, residential homes that we require a conditional use permit in certain districts. So one, one option might be to allow it on large lot residential areas like ag zoning and R40 as a use by right up to a certain size and then as the lots get smaller and the houses get smaller we would assume uh, that we impose condition as a conditional use and then have certain conditions such as amount of open space uh, per residence or number of residents parking to address that uh, prohibiting signs and that type of thing to we remove the commercial aspects of, of that from uh, our ordinance, which is also uh, a limiting factor in the existing community residential homes is they can't be operated on a commercial basis. So you don't get these large institutional uh, facilities. So those are the options we have and what we'll provide you at the next meeting or in your agenda package for the next meeting is uh, the list of the definitions that are used in the state statute. So you can distinguish the differences between the different types of potential community residential homes. Questions for the staff? Where did, I'll just pose this question. I know this this conversation started with talking about homes for the aged, uh, and I just need to get my head kind of wrapped around. Um, we've gone into other. We'll go back one slide. We've gone into. Um, um, mental handicap, which I'm using the wrong terminology, I think, but um, and 101, person with disability does not include persons who have a mental illness. I'm trying to understand the significance of that line right there. Is that saying that mental illness doesn't fall into the category which we currently uh, uh, approve for group homes? That's correct. Our, is that what we're also discussing when we discuss this? Are we are we discussing group homes for the mentally ill? To a certain yeah. extent, Mr. Chairman, to a certain extent, we are uh, restricted in our ability to regulate group homes within the single family residential zoning district. TCA separates homes for the aged from group home uh, in different sections of TCA code. So we would be under this option with community residential home, we would be amending the zoning ordinance to fit homes for the aged under community residential home and therefore allowing it as a right 
as a by right use in all residential districts. Okay, but in no way are we open, and, and I understand why we're opening that up, we're trying to work that into uh, the community. But we're not talking about working in those other categories, wellness or other terminology. Uh, are we? These, uh, Mr. Chairman, these five types of uh, homes are defined in TCA separately. So if we go with the strict definition of homes for the aged, it would not include adult care home, independent living facility, residential HIV supportive living facility, residential hospice, or traumatic brain injury residential home. Okay. Hey, Josh, so I think, I think I understand what you're saying correctly. Just adding it to our existing code, maybe the simplest way to do it. But and you're saying we, well, I think the next slide what we were just talking about was, was confusing. That it's, yeah, that it could be taken farther to add these other uses, but that's not what we're talking about today. Is that correct? The, the way that I originally approached this was to, uh, to use the strict definition mirroring what TCA says and allow this as a conditional use in residential and mixed use districts. Uh, it's been further expanded to potentially include these five uses as defined by TCA uh, or opening up and or opening up community residential home um, to fit homes for the aged within it. Any other questions or discussion? Being none, um, we'll uh, we'll take the issue back up in a couple of weeks. Is there any other business or uh, announcement of staff? Um, I think I may have mentioned this before, but I just wanted to remind uh, the board that the county, of course, is. Um, essentially shut down, if you will, but they are moving forward with an a, a, uh, ordinance that will rescind the city's regional planning authority. And let me say the regional zoning authority is really what they're doing. So they would do away by enacting a new zoning ordinance to take away the city's ability to zone in the planning region. So I don't know, obviously they were proposing to do that by probably early summer. I'm sure that with the results of having the coronavirus um, uh, in limbo right now, we don't know when that might be approaching the planning uh, commission at the county level and then ultimately the county commission. But that's something that will um, certainly affect the environs immediately around certain parts of the city. And so that uh, would mean effectively that the regional zoning board of appeals would really wouldn't have much need for that at all, if any, because we won't have that. And your authority to you know, a place and enforce zoning just outside the city limits would be rescinded as well. Uh, the concern that I have is that they have indicated that they would zone all those properties that are currently in our planning region, but in the county as rural residential. So there would be some non-conforming properties out there as a result of that that be created, but they would be outside the city. Now they still would be uh, eligible for annexation if they petition the city for annexation because they're all within the urban growth boundary. And that would be it. That's all I have to add. Is, is that in question, or does the county just have the authority to do that? The county has the authority to do that by statute. Okay. Uh, any other announcements? Well, I'll just go, I'll just say that um, 
I want to thank the IT department for pulling this together because I thought this worked very well. Other than the occasional depth, you know, coming under the occasional depth charge attack, we this this worked great, and I think everybody could hear well, and um, having the visual helps a lot too. Do y'all have any comments on that? No, but I do. I want. I do want to remind the board, uh, the planning commission, that our next meeting is not in two weeks. It's actually three weeks. So it is on the twenty seventh, and of course we are meeting on the sixth, and we normally meet on the second Tuesday for work session. So there's three week gap, but you'll receive an email and notification. Just a little reminder. Um, very good. If there's okay. no other, uh, anybody else have any comments? Very good. I think then we'll we'll adjourn. Um, have a great night. Good Thank job, you. guys. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good evening.